Welcome to Norse Code, the number one podcast for your Minnesota Vikings. I'm your host, Dusty O'Connell, and I'm getting over a cold. <laughs> <laughs> Joining me, the there. snicker you hear through the other end of the tin can and string is our long-suffering Minnesota Vikings blogger extraordinaire, generally useful human, Arif Hassan. How you doing, Arif? <laughs> I'm good, despite the long-suffering, I guess. <laughs> it's... You you suffer this fool gladly, and uh, for that I am grateful. If uh, you believe that this show is worth anything to you, then you can make a contribution in any dollar amount you would like at paypal.me slash Norse Code. Just throw a few bucks in the tip jar. We'd really appreciate it. You know, holidays are coming up, and uh, we you know would like to be able to afford more than uh, lumps of coal for our loved ones and, and so on and so forth. And uh, I, I imagine you probably would like to, you know, buy a, a gift for your cat or whatever. Is that, is that a thing you guys do? Do you, do you get uh, Christmas presents for your pets? Uh, we, we don't, uh, because our cats do not recognize, like, birthdays or Christmas. But we do, like, get our cat, like, stuff, and she's happy at times. It's pretty randomly, you know, figured out. Is she a, a catnip enthusiast or not? Uh, she enjoys the occasional catnip, but not as much as uh, as one of the other cats in the house. The other, one of the other cats in the house is a dedicated catnip enthusiast. I read uh, the other day that apparently affinity for catnip is genetic, and not all cats have the gene. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. Our cat isn't interested in, like, most things, so <laughs> it's hard for me to tell <laughs> if her... I'm not going to say apathy for catnip, because she does like it, but... It's hard to say if her relative disinterest is genetic or if it's just like, yeah, the only two things in the world I care about are food and this particular brand of toy ball. So so she likes it about as much as she likes anything, it sounds like. Well, more than most things in that she does <laughs> <Okay>. care. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, well, all right then. Uh, get some get some catnip for, uh, for Arif's uh, ennui struck cat. <laughs> it's one of the only things that brings her joy. Uh, you can become a recurring contributor to Norse Code by going to patreon.com slash Norse Code and uh, contributing in any dollar amount that you desire. A uh, $5 contribution either via the PayPals or Patreon will net you one of those sweet Norse Code stickers that uh, we had printed to start the season. And uh, yeah, just include your address when you make your contribution and thank you in advance. And of course, thank you to everybody in the past that has contributed to Norse code, uh, five years strong on the backs of listener donations, which we are relentlessly proud of. And, uh, you know, the, the money doesn't hurt either. Yeah. Right. It's, it's, it's lovely that, that we get a bit of scratch, but it's fantastic that people are, are willing to, to support the show. I know such a, such a great little, uh, cottage community we have and now like like the the daily norseman should like rebrand itself as a podcast network yeah it's like, true it's like a podcast haven at this point they're like podcast central for for everybody associated with the vikings and even many who are not <laughs> yeah, a, that's true in a professional capacity at least uh so this week we play the falcons and uh, we've got a great guest. I uh, unfortunately was unavailable for the interview, but I can still introduce it, which is you know basically the same function as I um, as I serve every preview week. But this week we've got Chuck McDonald at Four Verts on Twitter. He's a writer for Football Outsiders and a host of Setting the Edge with uh, least valuable player per Norse code, or I guess least valuable guest Justice Mosqueda. I don't know how they manage to crank out content every week, given the uh, the bugaboo that he is upon pretty much all of our technology. Uh, uh, I, I will not reveal the communications that I have received from Chuck and or Justice about their podcast, but I will say this is not a not recurring problem. <laughs> well, <laughs> that makes me feel a little better. Uh, he also occasionally breaks down film for The Falcoholic, which... Uh, was, I mean, obviously the other things he does are really great, but uh, he does have some special insight into the Falcons. So uh, without further ado, here's Arif and Chuck McDonald in an interview recorded earlier today. Uh, so this is Charles McDonald with uh, Football Outsiders, the Setting the Edge podcast, which you can find at settingedge.com or on iTunes and occasionally for the Falcoholic. What's up, Chuck? 
What's up? Um, I'm glad that the Falcons have kind of brought their season back to life and made this Vikings game worth watching because when I looked at the schedule a few weeks ago, I was like, man, I don't even know if I want to watch that game. It's going to be an utter beatdown. But they've kind of found their groove the past three weeks. And uh, I, I think that the NFC South race and uh, I, I guess really the entire NFC race is going to be fun starting this week. And this is a, a marquee matchup to to watch for sure. Yeah, it really seems like every team is kind of turned around because the Saints looked awful first two weeks. Uh, the Panthers, Cam wasn't getting it together the first couple of weeks. Falcons uh, couldn't figure out uh, their offense uh, first uh, couple of months, actually, not just the first couple of weeks. Uh, and, you know, before before the season started, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the schedule and I'm like, oh, wow, that, that end of season stretch is tough. Because uh, you get you know you got the Falcons, the Panthers, uh, and the Packers, and then halfway through the season, I'm like, holy crap, that end of the season stuff looks great. That's fantastic. And now it's you know it's it's difficult again. Uh, what? How how has Sarkeesian, the new offensive coordinator for the Falcons, how has he unscrewed up the offense? Like what what happened to change the offense the past three weeks? Because they scored what 27 and then 30 plus 30 plus last three weeks. Yeah, I I think. What, what kind of happened is uh, I don't know if at the start of the season he just didn't know what he had in terms of personnel, which is kind of embarrassing. Just if you if you just go watch what they did last season, like there's no reason why you should ever start a season like that or have stretches where you go uh, where you don't score a point against the Vikings or not the Vikings, but the Dolphins and the Patriots, two of the worst defenses in the league this year. Like that should never happen. But I, I think one thing that's happened is he's kind of figured out who he has in terms of personnel. And, you know, last week, Julio Jones finally got the 15 target game that we've all been hoping for. And, and uh, he went off for like 12 catches, 250 yards and two touchdowns, which is, you know, it, it's kind of frustrating because, you know, he could do something like in that realm every week, but he just hasn't gotten the targets. And uh, I, I think that Sark is, he, he's not calling plays as scared as he was towards the start of the season. You know, when we first came into the season and, you know, they started, they kind of got off to a roll a little bit. That, that Bears game was tough, but they played well against the Packers and the Lions. And, but even then, Sark was still calling a lot of short patterns, short routes, uh, a lot of plays where it was dependent on the tight end or the running back or receiver to get the ball. And he, and for some reason to start the season, he was given a lot of targets to Taylor Gabriel and Austin Hooper, which was just kind of dumb when you have uh, Julio Jones, you know, sitting right there like a, a cyborg at receiver. But we, we finally found our way there now. And uh, just him opening up the playbook and allowing Matt Ryan to take more deep shots down the field. And then Matt Ryan's having a great season again. So I'm I'm pretty excited to see what the back half of this season holds. Another back half, but like this final stretch, like the last five or so games. Yeah, kind of lucky that um, the, the Falcons uh... – faltered at the same time it felt like other nfc uh, south teams were faltering uh and in the team that you know a lot of people thought would be ascendant the tampa bay buccaneers uh had some problems and then uh they've got a big problem in the fact that fitzpatrick is playing so really the nfc south feels pretty wide open do you feel like the falcons are probably not favorites given how well the saints are playing right now but are in a really good position for the nfc south yeah they're in a they're in great position for the nfc south and you know they still get two shots at the Saints. They have another shot at the uh, the Panthers, and they still have to play the Bucks again. So, like the the way that their season schedule was set up, they've only played uh, two divisional games so far, and I think their first one came in like Week Nine against uh, Carolina. So, they still have to play. Uh, was it four more divisional games? And you know you got a game against the Vikings, and I, I think that the what they've shown the past three weeks kind of gives you a little bit of hope that they're finding their mojo. You know, this is kind of what damn Quinn teams have done uh, since he's been there. You know, they have, they start out hot, you know, 2015, 2016. Uh, they started out hot. Even this year, they started out, uh, I think it was a three and one or four and one this year. They kind of falter down the middle, but then they, they end on a, on a hot streak. So I, I feel like we're kind of picking up steam towards where the Falcons usually get their stuff together under Dan Quinn, and I, I, I'm honestly really, really excited for this Minnesota game. Are you, uh, are you a little bit concerned that uh, this offensive explosion hasn't come against uh, a defense that – I mean, because you know, there, there's the Seattle game, but of course Seattle didn't have Richard Sherman or Earl Thomas, um, and I think, I think they were missing a pass rusher too. 
Um, yeah, uh, Cliff Averill's out for the season, too. Right, yeah, Cliff Averill's out for the season. And then, you know, Dallas and then Tampa Bay. It doesn't really feel like they've been tested against a top-half defense. Do you, do you feel like this offensive explosion is genuine or in part a product of playing bad defenses, or, or, or how do you feel about that? I think it's a little bit of both because one thing that I – like to do like when i'm watching either players or teams or whatever like, are you winning the matchups that you're supposed to be winning uh so you know early in the season when they got shut out by the viking or the dolphins in the second half i did that again jesus christ <laughs> uh when they got shut out by the dolphins in the second half and i mean i, I was looking at some numbers today from football outsiders and uh the dolphins have like I think this season they have the seventh worst pass defense in the past thirty years or something like that. So, so obviously you get shut out by them uh, was embarrassing, and then to go almost the entire game against the Patriots without scoring was embarrassing again. But uh, I I think that just being able to take the advantage take advantage of uh, lesser defenses like the Cowboys, like the Seahawks without Richard Sherman or Cam Chancellor or Cliff Averill, then the Bucks defense is a disaster this year too. So obviously this is going to be their toughest test of the season, but I'm glad that they're turning towards what they were doing last year in terms of just beating up on, on awful defenses. So it, it, it's going to be a fun test. Uh, I think both sides of the ball should be really entertaining uh, for this entire game. Uh, and I, I, I really just can't wait. Uh, yeah, so let's talk about uh, some of the matchups and uh, and just generally speaking, uh, what that offense can look forward to. And then you know we'll we'll, we'll flip sides of the ball. We'll talk about how Xavier Rhodes is suddenly better than Desmond Trufant. You know that kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, it took a while, uh, <laughs> but yeah. Uh, so the, the first thing that that always you know I, I, I'm most excited just generally speaking about the Vikings defensive line. Yeah, Harrison Smith probably the best player on the defense, probably one of the most impactful in terms of how they how they design their scheme. But I just really like watching the Vikings defensive line, and, and you're kind of the same way. Uh, what do you think about the way that Vikings defensive line matches up against uh, the the Falcons offensive line? Uh, I I kind of like. Not I don't, I don't think uh, the Falcons have an advantage uh, per se in the trenches, but I do like having Alex Mack versus Linval Joseph. That's going to be a fun matchup to watch. And then on the edge, you know, uh, two years ago, Everson Griffin gave Jake Matthews hell in that uh, that uh, the game that they played in Atlanta uh, in 2015. So it's going to be cool to see if he can get redemption there. Obviously, Daniil Hunter has emerged as a huge force, and uh, Ryan Schrader's gone against a lot of elite pass rushers the past two seasons, and, and Hunter's just the, the next one up. So I, I don't know if the Falcons have an advantage in the trenches. I don't know if the Vikings have an advantage in the trenches, but I do think we, we have a better Jake Matthews player in 2017 than we did in 2015, and mm-hmm. uh Obviously, Ryan Schrader, I think he's one of the best right tackles in the league. So just being able to watch uh, those three matchups in particular is, is going to be a lot of fun. And then you got to see if Wes Schweitzer can hold his own against his matchups with Linval Joseph and uh, Tom Johnson, I think, is the other defensive tackle. So yeah. that that's going to be a really fun matchup to watch in the trenches. Uh, you got two pretty much, I think, borderline all pro talents in, in Mac and Joseph on the middle. And then uh, definitely accomplished players on the edge with Griffin Matthews and then uh, Schrader and Hunter. Yeah. So the, the Falcons offensive line way different than it was two, three years ago. Uh, you know, the addition of Alex Mack sounds like that was a really huge part of the way the offensive line has changed. Uh, the evolution of Jake Matthews. Do you really feel like, you know, it's gone from a weakness to a strength for the Falcons or do you think that they're kind of at, you know, this is an acceptable level. The rest of this personnel can kind of take care of business. I, I think it's uh, definitely one of the strengths of the team. And what was funny, if you looked at it last year, uh, just in terms of sack percentage and tackle for loss percentage, or even, uh, you know, some of the stats that we have on Sunday Edge or some of the stats that football outsiders have, the Falcons, they weren't a great team in terms of limiting penetration to the backfield. Like they, they were, I think, in the bottom eight of the league last year with in terms of giving up sacks and tackles for losses. But what was weird on the flip side was they were one of the best teams in the league in terms of springing open big plays in the running game. And what I think you're seeing this year is uh, I think some of the rushing plays aren't quite as explosive, but I think that's mainly still due to Sarkeesian trying to figure out uh, how he wants to use Freeman and Coleman. But uh you, you do see a lot less uh, – you see a lot fewer sacks, a lot fewer tackles for loss in the backfield. So it, it's, a, it's a unit that's improved year to year to year. And you know we're just all kind of waiting for 
you know, they, they've exploded the past three weeks, but we're all kind of waiting for that perfect game that they that they put together fairly routinely in 2016. And I don't know if it comes this weekend, but uh, I, I do like their chances to at least match up well against the Vikings defensive line, which is I mean, which has just terrorized people this season. Sure. Uh, well, let's talk about uh, let's talk about those skill players because any perfect game from the Falcons will heavily feature Julio Jones. It'll feature probably a standout performance from Mohamed Sanu, and of course, we'll see a lot of stuff from both Tevin Coleman and Devonta Freeman. Let's talk about Sanu and Jones first. Uh, so Xavier Rhodes didn't do any shadowing or. or extreme shadowing back in 2015 certainly not in 2014 um of julio jones there are some statistics out there uh both uh both ledbetter at orlando ledbetter at uh, the atlanta journal constitution and a vikings blocker robert rydell have logged uh Rhodes holding jones to two catches for 27 yards while covering him on partial snaps in 2015 uh, but this is probably the first game that Rhodes is going to be covering jones uh in sort of a in, in a shadow role. Uh, he'll probably have some safety help, but for the most part, the Vikings kind of want this matchup to be a little bit of a one-on-one. Now, Julio Jones is either the best or second best receiver in the league, depending on who you ask. Certainly the most physically talented top-tier receiver in the NFL. How do you think that matchup goes? Uh, because last time, Julio Jones had 56 yards. The time before that, uh, in 2014, 86 yards. Certainly not better than, than his yards per game average, but certainly like not awful either. Yeah, I I think Julio is just one of those guys where you just gotta throw it to him you know, fifteen times a game. I mean, we've had we've seen games where uh, Patrick Peterson has shadowed him across the field and he's annihilated Patrick Peterson. I mean, he destroyed Marcus Peters last year in that matchup against the Chiefs. Like, I, I just think that no matter who's guarding him, uh, if you want to put Prime Revis on it, you still gotta throw him. You still gotta get him double digit targets because he's just such an explosive weapon and. One thing that the Falcons have figured out the past couple of weeks is uh, when they run those deep play action crossers, almost no one can run can cover the field with Julio. If you're going to run horizontally across the field, you know, 20 yards down the field, he's going to be open towards the sideline almost every single time. And I think that's just due to, I mean, he's just, he's just a freak of nature. I, I think I remember you said he broke your athletic uh, measurements when yeah. he was coming out in the draft. So yeah, and it, and it looks like even through all the injuries, he hasn't really lost a step. So. Uh, I, I think that he would fare well against Xavier Rhodes. Obviously, it's kind of a, a match of the Titans that we've uh, that we're going to see on Sunday. But I, I still expect Julio to to, uh, to get his uh, for I guess for lack of a better term. Sure, and then we can talk a little bit about Mohamed Sanu. There was a lot of griping about his contract last season and whether or not he's overpaid. It's kind of irrelevant at this point. He's yeah. the second receiver, uh, and he's been doing a pretty good job this year, even when he's not throwing the ball. What do you think about him in a matchup against Trey Waynes? Uh, that's going to be, I think that's a matchup that the Falcons can really exploit because one thing that, that I, I guess I'd undersold about Muhammad Sanu coming into when he, when they signed him last season, cause I was not a fan of that sign like right. at all. I, I thought it was uh, a waste of money. I didn't think he was that good, but I've been surprised at how well he's kind of complimented Julio Jones over the past, uh, I guess, one and a half seasons now. And one thing that I really love about Muhammad Sanu is that he's really, like, extremely physical uh, at the catch point, running routes after the catch. Like, his whole mentality is just, I'm going to have to try and run you over and just make it uh, make life hell for you for the entire game. I mean, last week he had a catch uh, where he he got the ball and then he got 10 yards after the catch. And instead of just kind of trying to get away from TJ Ward, the safety, he just ran him right over. And that's kind of, that's the kind of intensity that you see him play with all the time. And yeah, he's, he probably is overpaid for a number two receiver, but he, the way that he fits into the offense so well in terms of being able to play outside, being able to be a, a big slot receiver, a guy who can make plays after the catch, he, he really does open up a lot for the offense. And I, I don't think that, Trey Waynes is the guy that's going to, I guess, cut down on what Muhammad Sanu does well. I mean, obviously, if, if Sanu's getting like 12 targets, you've probably lost the game. But uh, I, I do think that he should fare well in his, in his matchup against Trey Waynes. And then when uh, when Gabriel uh, gets onto the field, uh, do you kind of rotate who the slot receivers are? Is is it Julio in the slot sometimes, uh, Sanu in the slot sometimes? Or do you have, you know, generally speaking, it's Gabriel in the slot or Sanu in the slot? Like, what's, what's the sort of setup there? Uh, it's not as you know, last year. It, I mean, it could be anybody. Last year, last year they would have Devonta Freeman, Tevin Coleman in the slot. But this year, it, it's it's more uh, Sanu and Gabriel playing in the slot and having Julio outside, uh, 
when all the, when those three guys are on the field. I do think they mi- they mix it up pretty well in terms of uh, having Gabriel in the slot and Sanu outside and vice versa. But you can kind of tell that Gabriel, even though he he thinks he does, he doesn't really thrive on the outside. I mean, that's just it's just the nature of how five eight guys tend to work. But if he can get the ball in his hands in space. He's been able to make some stuff happen the past year and a half. But this year with Gabriel, it's a little bit different because Sark, he doesn't set up the screens as well as Shanahan used to. You know, Shanahan would get you into a point where the defense is calling out pretty much you know, a, a seven-man blitz. And then he would just throw a screen to Gabriel behind it and I mean, you're off to the races then. But uh, Sark hasn't really gotten a feel for how to use Gabriel this season, which you know, I, I guess he's more of a gadget player than I thought he was under Shanahan, but that, that's fine. I, I I don't expect Gabriel to do anything really week to week because he's just such a hit or miss player, but I, I do think they've done a good job of rotating uh, Sanu and Gabriel from the slot. I, I just want some more Tevin Coleman throws. Uh, that's all I want in my life. <laughs> uh, well, so uh, I, I find the running back rotation kind of cool because uh, you know, Tevin Coleman has largely been treated over the past two years as a complimentary uh, catch and run kind of back. You know, he can you can run up the middle, but you know, he often runs out the outside. Uh, he catches the ball uh, in space and stuff like that. But you know, Devonta Freeman is like good at those things too, uh, and so he can be. I don't think he's gotten any targets over the past couple of weeks, but he can be um, a threat out of the backfield too. Is the is the passing game? Uh, you know, a big part of the way the Falcons use the running backs, or does it feel like kind of a nice bonus? Uh, last year, it was a big thing that they they used the backs a lot in the passing game. I mean, I think Tevin Coleman averaged like 15 yards a catch last season, which is just outrageous for a running back. But uh, this year, the passing game has been much more wide receiver and tight end oriented. I mean, you just said uh, – Tevin Coleman, he's been taking like the bulk of the snaps for uh, what three weeks now because Freeman got hurt in the first, like the second drive of that Cowboys game, mm-hmm. and I don't think he's gotten any targets in the passing game. So it, it's more focused on the receivers and the tight ends. I really wish that they would kind of go back to what they did last year and use uh, Tevin Coleman in the slot a little bit more because the one reception I remember he he got in the slot this year was uh, against the Panthers and he took it straight like 20 yards for a touchdown that it was it's just it's so easy for him like when you see him get into open field he's really fast he's uh he sees holes a lot better than he did uh when he first got into the league so i i, I would hope that they try to maybe flex him outside and get him matched up uh in single coverage against maybe uh Kendricks or Barr because I mean I mean well, well Barr's a freak we all remember that play when Tevin Cohen broke loose for like a 50 yard run and Barr <laughs> yeah. hunted him down and punched the ball that was I mean that was that was wild but, yeah yeah <laughs> I, I I I would just like to see them get outside but just based on their tendencies so far this season it's it's probably not going to happen it's going to be you know Julio Gabriel Sanu Hooper as your your main you know, your as your main uh passing targets so let's talk a little bit about what happens in a world where the running backs are used a little bit more in the passing game, kind of like they were last year. So Barr and Kendricks will be covering the running backs. Barr has improved in coverage pretty substantially. This may be his best year in coverage um, by a good margin. And then Kendricks has probably gotten a little bit worse uh, in coverage over what he was last year. But they're both really good coverage linebackers. How do you feel about that kind of matchup? And then sort of the next question is, how do you feel about that matchup when it comes to the tight ends? Uh, I I feel more comfortable with Freeman and Coleman kind of doing, I, I guess like that slot wide receiver stuff than I do the tight ends. I mean Hooper, Hooper is an interesting guy because he's sometimes he looks like a guy who could be a top three tight end in the league, but he has a lot of mental errors where he'll just either run a route too deep that causes an interception or he'll he'll drop a ball or he'll lose the catch point. But one thing that's, that's really cool about Hooper is he's really good after the catch. But the way you have to set that up for him is you kind of have to almost run like tight end screens for him where he's going to get the ball in the flat. <laughs> and then uh, you'll have Julio and Sanu block for him, which has been like successful plays for them. But obviously you, you'd rather have like Tevin Coleman running those plays sure. than Austin Hooper uh, or Devonta Freeman running those plays in Austin Hooper. So I, I, I would like to see them kind of, Hey, if you just swap what you can do with Hooper with Tevin Coleman, maybe you could get a 15 yard gain instead of a seven yard gain or a 20 yard gain instead of a 12 yard gain. But it, it, it's just, it's just still, uh, you know, as, as much as the results have been better in the past few weeks, it's still a work in progress. Sure. But uh, I, I just, I would like to see, 
Tevin Coleman and Devonta Freeman get out in the passing game because we saw them be so explosive there last year. I mean, last year there was there's a game against the Broncos where uh, they put Tevin Coleman out to the slot and the Broncos came out in a uh, in man coverage. So you have Tevin Coleman matched one on one with a linebacker right at the seam and uh, Ryan found him for a touchdown. And, and when you have a guy who can run a four three get matched up on a guy who runs you know a four six, yeah, you would hope that you try to exploit that a little bit more often. So it's a little bit different with Anthony Barr, though, right? I mean, he ran a four four at his pro yeah, day. Yeah, um, you know him yeah, and, and Ryan Shazier. Yeah, him and Ryan Shazier are like the two fastest linebackers that maybe the NFL has seen in like thirty years. I don't know, but uh, but certainly the, the matchup. I think it changes pretty substantially. What do you think about like how the presence of someone like an athletic freak like Barr changes how the how the Falcons will approach uh, this game. Do you think they're going to funnel even more targets to the wide receivers? I would, I think so. Uh, or maybe you try to get uh, Austin Hooper matched up on bar and just don't throw him the ball because that's one thing that Shanahan was really good at last year. Uh, he would motion out Austin Hooper and get Hooper matched up on your number one wide receiver. And then next thing you know, you got like a safety or a linebacker covering Julio Jones and, and that shit's disaster. So mm-hmm. I, I think if you can just get Barr to a point where not that he doesn't have an impact on the game, because I mean, he, he's, he's too good not to, but if you can kind of minimize his impact with motions or uh, maybe run plays away from him, uh, throw more to your receivers and your running backs, that's kind of how you get him out of the game. But if they get into a, a, if they kind of revert back to their early season phase where they were just funneling targets towards Hooper and Gabriel, like right towards the middle of the defense, that's going to be uh, a, a bad, that's a bad way to approach attacking the Vikings defense, in my opinion. Sure. Uh, and then Matt Ryan himself looks like he's playing better, too. Some of that probably has to do with the way the offensive design has changed. Um, but, you know, over the past two seasons, um, you know, it feels like. Maybe we can't. No one's putting him in the conversation of like you know, quote unquote, elite, which I guess is not a word we use anymore because Joe Flacco ruined it. But uh, <laughs> but you know, he's he's sort of you know he he's entered and exited and entered and exited this conversation of kind of the upper tier quarterbacks. What do you think about him just as a quarterback? Like we know you know he was brilliant with Kyle Shanahan, but everyone just kind of agrees Kyle Shanahan is brilliant. So what, what do you think? What do you think of just Matt Ryan? Man, this year I I kind of feel like he's been. I think he's been great this season, honestly. Uh, just when you go back and and look at like the interceptions, uh, I, I would I think only two have have really been on him, and uh, there have been a lot of drops that turn into interceptions. Uh, two plays where Hooper ran the wrong route that turned into interceptions, uh, and you know if you look at Pro Football Focus, I think he has the lowest percentage of tur- turnover worthy throws in the league right now. So maybe the offensive or the not the offense, but the passing game output isn't as explosive as it was last year. But I still think he's playing great football, and he was uh, dealing with kind of getting used to Sark's play calling early in the season. But I think he's been really accurate on all his throws. Uh, I I kind of feel stupid for just. <laughs> trashing him all the 2015 season because he because i was he's defending been, him to you i remember this i know yeah to, to me and parsons yeah <laughs> but uh he i mean obviously last season he was amazing and i think i think this year he, honestly I, I think his play this year has been just as good as, as last year but i uh, not like the i guess the person pulling the strings isn't as good as the person as sure. last year uh him or carson wentz i'm taking ryan i don't care <laughs> I don't care what any dumb Eagles fan has to say. You got all that. You got like the easiest offense to play, and you're barely completing sixty percent of your passes. Good for you, bud. <laughs> He's got more Pro Bowl votes than uh, than any other quarterback, including Tom Brady, by fifty thousand. Good God. <laughs> All right, so uh, before we switch sides and, and talk about the other matchup, who on the Vikings defense scares you the most? It could be Harrison Smith. We didn't talk about him or Sandeo that much. It could be Everson Griffin, Linval Joseph, Xavier Rhodes. Who, or, or Anthony Barr, we were talking about him a little bit. Who, who do you think scares you the most when they're on the field for the defense? Uh, I think I'm going to go with Daniel Hunter just because you know over the last two seasons we've seen Schrader, he, goes, he went against uh, – so like Von Miller, Khalil Mack, uh, Justin Houston, or no, no, Justin Houston didn't play in that game. But you know he goes against Cam Wake, uh, or not Cam Wake, Cam Jordan in the division twice. Mm-hmm. He went against Cam Wake this year. You know he's played a lot of elite pass rushers, and sometimes 
he'll like he'll do well for the most part, but then he'll have maybe like two plays, two or three plays that where he just gets roasted. And I, that's what kind of scares me about this Vikings game is if Hunter can get uh, past Schrader and he times it perfectly, you know, maybe Schrader blocks him well for the most part, but those two or three p- plays that uh, he gets beat, those can change a game. And uh, we saw those, we saw that happen versus Buffalo this year when uh, Jerry Hughes got past him for uh, it was a, it was a BS fumble call, but they turned it back for a touchdown. And yeah, maybe you, you block well for uh, 49 or 39 out of your 42 passing plays, but you get beat three times and, and those can end up changing the game for you. So uh, Hunter scares me the most for sure. Uh, speaking of, what do you think of Jerry Hughes? Like he's kind of a mystery. I don't, I, I, I do think that uh, Indy's defense is just cursed because dude, how do you let that guy go? And then he turns into like a double digit sack artist. It, it's kind of weird, but uh, I I thought that he he kind of he benefited a lot from playing next to Kyle Williams and Marcel Darius uh, mm-hmm. for a few years. But I mean, and and since Darius has uh, been traded from the Bills, I mean, <laughs> I, I I don't want to say that he was responsible for everything, but good God, like that defense has completely fallen apart. Like in terms of how often they get into the backfield, how often they get sacks, how often they turn the ball over, like just their average yards per play, like it's plummeting over the past uh, month since they let him go. So I, I don't know if Jerry Hughes can be your best defensive lineman, but he uh, he's a stud. What, what, are the be- what are the best defensive lines? You know, obviously Jacksonville's in the conversation. I think that Minnesota's in the conversation. Philadelphia's in the conversation. Um, I'm probably missing a huge one right now, but who, who do you think are the best defensive lines? Uh, yeah. So obviously, you know, Jacksonville, um, Minnesota, let me just pull up like the sack numbers we have on set in the right, edge yeah. right now. So, yeah. So, like, yeah. The- so one thing that, one thing that your blog does with, I'm not going to name him. The other guy at the blog <laughs> <laughs> is, uh, is, you know, producing sack and tackle for loss numbers to create successful penetration plays for individual defensive linemen. Something that Everson Griffin doesn't actually rank all that high in, but I think it's pretty good work despite the fact that it, it underrates like his contribution to the defense. Um, and it, it's probably a pretty good proxy for how defensive lines do in general. Yeah. So for, uh, I still need to put up the, uh, the week 12 version but this is just from like before last week's game so like the top 10 in terms of a sack percentage value which is i guess your sack percentage over uh your sacks your sack percentage divided by like the average sack percentage and then multiplied by the amount of dropbacks you go against yeah uh so jacksonville's first by a pretty pretty wide margin then pittsburgh chicago carolina baltimore's fifth uh the Chargers are sixth. Atlanta was seventh, but they're actually tenth in the new version. And then uh, the Vikings were at thirteenth last week, but in the new one that I haven't posted yet, they were in the top ten. So uh, it, it's going to be it's going to be a fun matchup, man. I'm I'm really excited for both sides of the ball. Like I, I, this is one of those games I wish that they could flex into the primetime slot. But hey, I guess we got to watch Joe Flacco uh, <laughs> drag, drag his balls up and down the field against the Steelers. So. <laughs> That that'll be you know, it's a it's a classic rivalry check. I don't know why you don't like uh, <laughs> AFC Steelers North Ravens Westville. matchups. <laughs> I mean, you're uh, you're a son of Baltimore. I don't know why why you're not a uh, why you're not such a huge fan. Because it's not 2007 anymore. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's talk, let's talk about the other side of the field uh, or the other side of the ball. Um, so Vikings offense weirdly explosive. Feels like for different reasons every week. Um, Case Keenum at the helm again. Um, I'm not like upset or resigned about it. I'm just anxious. But, uh, you know, an offensive line that's pretty substantially improved. Two receivers that as a pair may be better than any other pair uh, in the NFL, obviously going up against a pretty good candidate for uh, for that this week with the, with the Falcons. But still, top three receiver pair in the league. Uh, Jarek McKinnon and Latavius Murray – uh, you know, have been running the ball pretty effectively, not as effectively as if they had Dalvin Cook, but, you know, whatever, that's fine. Um, so the people that intrigue me the most on the defense uh, for the Falcons are the ones that can provide a ton of team speed. So Deion Jones, huge last year, pretty good this year. Keanu Neal, one of the better strong safeties in the league, may overtake Cam Chancellor given enough time. He's already better. Yeah, he's already better. <laughs> uh, and uh, And 
Uh, Desmond Trufant I like a lot. Robert Alford is a physical freak at corner. Not as good as, uh, as, as a bunch of uh, CB2s, but certainly more valuable in specific matchups, I think. Um, what do you think about sort of the general defensive philosophy for the Falcons? Because, you know, a lot of people compare it to the, to the Seahawks from a coverage perspective, but a lot of people also try to make pains to talk about how they're different. So wh- what is the overall general defensive philosophy? Uh, it's it's kind of interesting to see how they've they've shifted since 2015. I mean, they used to play. I mean, just an overwhelming amount of cover three, uh, especially in 2015 when you had Paul Warlo and uh, Justin Durant as your backup, as your starting linebackers, and, and not even like good Justin Durant, like a broken down, feeble Justin Durant. Right. Uh, so they they kind of transitioned from. From heavy cover three to now they, they play a lot of man coverage this year. And I, I think that a lot of that has to do with, uh, one, Keanu Neal is a lot better in coverage than a lot of people thought he was going to be. He can he can match up with just about any tight end not named Travis Kelsey because, uh, I mean, Kelsey smoked him a few times last year. But mm. uh, you got Desmond Trufant who, I mean, I think we agree is one of the better corners in the league. And then Robert Alford can hold his own, too. And, and so can Brian Poole, who was a UDFA last year. So being able to, I guess, add in uh, Keanu Neal and Brian Poole into that cornerback group has helped a lot. And then going from Deion Jones and or going from Paul Worla and Justin Durant to Deion Jones and Devondre Campbell, I mean, I, I don't even know if I can like adequately describe how big of a, an upgrade that was, especially from a coverage perspective. I know, I know Campbell and Jones have both been shaky versus a run this year, but they've both been really, really good in coverage. And uh, that range and speed in the middle of the field is something that the Falcons didn't have before. So now that they, they play a lot of man coverage and they, they kind of just trust their guys to go out there and win. And, and if, if uh, Desmond Trufant is out this Sunday, which I mean, it's Wednesday, he didn't practice today. He's still in the co- uh, concussion protocol after a, uh, some friendly fire by Keanu Neal on Sunday. Uh, it, it's going to be interesting how to, to see how they, I, I guess, make up for his loss because CJ Goodwin is a huge step down from mm-hmm. the top three guys that they have. And we even saw last week, they, the Bucks, once Trufant got out, they just started throwing right at CJ Goodwin and he had, he had an awful game. So Devondra Campbell, best former gopher on the roster, right? Well, yeah, because Hagman, he's out of here. So I don't even know if they have any others. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's fair. Uh, Who's the best former Clemson guy on the roster? Grady Jarrett. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, he's he's better than Vic, for sure. I think think Grady Jarrett's been one of the best defensive tackles in the league this year. Just, uh, we haven't run our numbers for uh, tackle for loss or penetration values yet, like on a per snap basis. But last time we did, which was about two weeks ago, he was in the top 10 of the league. Uh, So Top 10 among defensive tackles or top 10 among defensive linemen? Defensive lineman. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah, he's 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 not he's not a great pass rusher, but man, he is he is an amazing run stopper uh, this season. So he he gets so much penetration to the backfield, and he he has been way more impactful than than Vic Beasley has this year, which is kind of weird Did, to see looking at Vic Beasley's get season last year, but right, it, yeah. it is what it is. Uh, it felt like for a second that Dante Fowler stole Vic Beasley's talent. What what happened with Vic Beasley? I don't know because he was – Vic was playing really well up until he got that shoulder injury. Uh, and, I mean, that was the second game of the season, so you, you can't put too much stock into that. But right. he was playing well up until he had that that shoulder injury. And then he, got, he came back, I think it was about a month later, and he's had a couple sacks since then. But, uh, like, if you just compare uh, what he's – what he looks like on the field compared to like Tack McKinley, it's it's night and day. I mean, Tack is by far the better player this year. I don't know if Vic is still like favoring that shoulder injury or or what, but he just doesn't look like the same explosive, aggressive guy that he did last year. Right. And then is Adrian Claiborne real? What's what's going on? He's kind of real. Uh, okay. I mean, if you like, if you go back and watch that that Cowboys game, he got six sacks, but that's one of those games where it's just like, whoa, that's just such an outlier performance. I mean, that just doesn't even make sense. Uh, he, and, I mean, he, he even said like he used the same move, yeah, the same on move, yeah, every single sack. And I'm, I went back and watched all six of them, and he did use the same move on every single sack. So, I, I think he's, 
I, I think he's definitely a guy you want in your rotation. Like if he's your third best pass rusher, you're in a pretty good spot. Uh, but for most of the season, uh, he's been a top two pass rusher with either Vic Beasley or Tack McKinley taking turns. And recently has been a lot of Tack McKinley. Uh, so I, I think he's like semi real. He's like Darth Vader where he's like half man half cyborg <laughs> <laughs> so uh so you got so we've got riley reef and uh mike it sounds like mike remmers is going to be back um because he could have been back for the detroit game but they wanted to play it safe because short week thanksgiving um and uh, and both of them have been performing better in pass protection this year than they had last year playing in the opposite sides of the line from where they should have been uh, and while Mike Remmers isn't playing as well as he did during the 2015 regular season for the Panthers, um, you know both of them are playing quite well uh, as, as pass protectors. So I think PFF has them both like deeply in the red. I think a lot of that has to do with the past two weeks. Um, what, what do you think about that matchup where you've got two tackles that win more with strength than with speed, um, but are at least solid in terms of uh, foundational technical ability? I. You know, I don't know what to really make of this one because I because when we when we run our uh, our like our offensive sack percentage values, the Vikings they're they're the top team in the league right now. Yeah. And I was just like, yo, I was like, what in the world is going on? Because I I hadn't Weird taken too much. Yeah, because yeah, especially from where they were last year, the year before. I mean, that's just an amazing leap. And like, I don't think they have the most I guess the most stout pass protecting line like you'll you'll see. Like I I would take. New Orleans pass blocking over them. I mean, not on a quantifiable level, but just like on a qualitative level. Where I see well, it. No, like, yeah, yeah, no. I, I actually I agree with you. I don't. I, I think individually, the individual offensive linemen in in terms of their pass protection traits, I would struggle to argue that as a whole, their talents put them in the top third of the NFL. But like you said, that they lead the league in sack percentage. It's and I think a lot of it is is Case Keenum. I mean, right. he does he does a lot to like to get away from these sacks or he'll hold onto the ball to the very last second for someone to get open. I mean, in that uh, the the Rams game, I, I think you already know which play I'm going to talk about. But the one where <laughs> he 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 was, it looked like he, like somebody was playing. He'd been Madden sacked three it, times. Yeah, yeah, it looked like someone was playing mad and his controller died, and he just had Rams bodies just flying all over him left and right, and then came back on at the right second and threw Adam Thielen that that ball for the first down. And just just watching Case Keenum maneuver the pocket is, is is amazing, especially just watching from where he was last year with the Rams. And yeah. I, I I do think that uh you know guys like Claiborne and McKinley can get advantage of of Reef and Remmers, but at the end of the day, you still got to get Case Keaton down, and that's something that he's just been unbelievably good at this year in terms of evading pressure and uh, allowing passing plays to, to survive. Well, so I'm going to say something absolutely disgusting, offensive, horrible. I want you to bear with me. When when Case Keenum uh, was nearly sacked against the Rams, he did like he basically leaned forward to change his center of gravity and slipped out of it. Uh, and then and then he threw the ball. The first person I thought of because I remember seeing him do this, I think against Washington, was Michael Vick. What are you doing? <laughs> no, no, no. It's it's not it's not about him running the ball. Obviously, Vic. It's totally different. Vic has a cannon for an arm. I'm just talking about the leaning forward, changing the center of balance, and slipping out of the sack. That's all I'm saying. I've seen Michael Vick do the same thing: get underneath the sack and get out of it. That's yeah. all I'm saying. Or even Carson Wentz, right? I don't know who you're talking about. <laughs> I've never heard of that name. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, but the case Keenum, I I had no idea he had this in him, honestly. And I, I mean, I'm not sure he did. Yeah, and I, I think he's obviously benefited from I mean having Diggs and Thielen, which is just it's a great duo. But still, he he's making some stuff happen on his own. Hey, well, let's we'll talk about Diggs and Thielen in a second because I'm I'm super excited about what your take is there. But the interior of the offensive line, uh, Nick Easton, Pat Elflin, and uh, and Joe Berger. Um, you know, up against uh, Dontari Poe, who's having a much better season, I think, this year uh, than uh, than last year. Um, where, where, he was he was with the Falcons last year, right? Or was he injured last year? Last year he was with the Chiefs. He was with the Chiefs. He, he was coming back from injury and was having a yeah. poor season. Yeah, that was it. They uh, killed him though. They killed him. They over did. They, they had a nose tackle playing a thousand snaps, dude. Yeah, uh, there were there were two seasons where he played over ninety percent of the defensive snaps. And like, dude, he's three hundred fifty pounds. What are you doing? 
Uh, best 350-pounder at, uh, at the Combine in Combine history. That's all. It's awful. I can't believe they did that. Uh, but yeah, so you've got um, you've got two fairly inconsistent, uh, both in a bad and good way, uh, with Easton and Elflin, where they allow a lot of pressure, they allow tackles for loss, and then they open up these enormous uh, holes uh, for like twenty, thirty yards. Uh, it, it's it's wild what Easton and Elflin um, do. To, like they're the same person at different positions. How do you feel about sort of that characterization and and what what you've seen of? the interior of the Vikings offensive line. I, th- I think that's, that's spot on. Uh, it, it's in terms of uh, like tackle for loss numbers. I think they're in the back half of the league, but uh, they still, they still have put together a fairly productive running game. I think the past few weeks for sure. Uh, and, you know, I, I think, I think with me, you have a guy like Eiflin, a, a rookie playing center, you're just gonna have to take your lumps there. And, you know, mm-hmm. Nick Eason's never, I mean, that, that's not something you really, get super duper excited about, but I, I think they do their jobs uh, well enough for the most part. I mean, y'all are nine and two with an offense that nobody really saw coming, especially when Sam Bradford got hurt. But uh, I, 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 I'm interested to see how Eiflin handles Don Terry Poe and Grady Jarrett because Poe has really, he's really come to life during his Falcons winning streak. I mean, he, uh, I think he had three pressures uh, versus Tampa Bay. He got a sack versus Dallas where he just absolutely whooped, uh, uh, Zach Martin, and then he played well versus Seattle. So I, I think Poe, you're starting to see him uh, get more comfortable in the scheme because uh, when he was in Kansas City, they kind of just had him two gap on the mm-hmm. line, you know, yeah. just kind of sit there and eat up blockers. But this year, Dan Quinn has been adamant about saying, you need to start getting up the field, up the field, up the field. And you're really starting to see him embrace that mentality and, and I guess style of play the past couple of weeks. And when, when he, he lost like 25 pounds uh, due to all those nice clauses in his contract where you get, you know, like $500,000 if you're right. 340 pounds, which is, which sounds amazing. But, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, he, he, he's really starting to figure it out. So it's going to be fun to see, like, it, it's almost like uh, a revamped Vikings offensive line versus a revamped Falcons defensive line. And, I think that both of those units have played a role in their recent success. Yeah, well, so, okay, so this is kind of interesting because Dontari Poe is being asked to be a little bit more aggressive. Linval Joseph, early in his career with Mike Zimmer, was asked to be less aggressive, to stay home, because he came from a giant system where all four of them would attack all the time. He did pretty well there, obviously, but in a different system he had to kind of revamp his playing style. And now he can be both aggressive and, and, and stay at home when he needs to. This emerged as kind of one of the top nose tackles in the league. Who would you take, Linval Joseph or Dontari Poe? Not for the Falcons, but just in general. Oh, Joseph. Yeah. What, yeah. what, what do you think about, about nose tackle play that is really difficult for people to evaluate? Uh, I think that sometimes at, at our, not just nose tackles, but defensive tackles in, in, you know, in totality, I think sometimes people get caught up in looking for guys like with the big stat numbers. And obviously that helps. But, uh, you know, if you go back and look at a guy like uh, Robert Kimdichie at, at Ole Miss, where he, yeah, you're going to bring up your uh, your Kimdichie article. Great, it's maybe one of the best pieces you've written. Even though <laughs> it is to it you, is. you're like this is super simple. I don't know what's what's interesting about it. Uh, but you know, he was he he would make a lot of plays uh, at the line of scrimmage or behind the line of scrimmage or get sacks. But he would do it in a way that leaves the rest of the defense extremely vulnerable. So you know, in in a basic sense, football, and I've talked about this before. I've written about it before. But when you look at front seven play and defensive line play and how they all incorporate together. It's kind of like a, a game of connect four is like when I was coaching, that's how I described it to the kids where each person has their own slot that they need to slide into. And if you have a guy uh, like a nose tackle, like Linval Joseph, who's always going to be where he needs to be, maybe he's not getting penetration up the field in every single play, but if he, if he's holding that a gap and pushing that back, maybe one or two yards, that's going to make life easier for the linebackers. It's going to make life easier for the defensive ends. It makes life easier for the safeties coming down and playing the run. Uh, so just having a guy in the middle or having a guy on the edge or really anywhere in the front seven who's going to stay home and just, it, it sounds very cliche, but just do what they're asked to do is is huge. And uh, I think Linval Joseph might be the best guy in the league in terms of just staying home and, uh, playing your gap te- technically sound, not trying to escape and make a big play on your own and just playing really good team defense. And I, I, I like that 
Zimmer kind of gives him the speed ball change up if he wants to. If he wants to go get back there and penetrate, he can. But uh, if he but that defense functions just fine with him uh, being a, a, a roadblock at the line of scrimmage. So one of the things, so you mentioned, uh, you know, defensive tackles that can be too aggressive and you know maybe make big plays, give up a bunch of big plays, kind of like. My criticism of like D'Angelo Hall back when he was putting up interception numbers was that he would give up a bunch of big plays too. Also, criticism of our mutual friend Sully Football of of JJ Watt and why he thought Dontari Poe at the time was better than JJ Watt. Uh, Watt did gamble a little bit, and he occasionally would give up a pretty big hole up the middle. But he also was producing twenty sack seasons as an interior defensive lineman. What do you, what do you think of of that? That okay. take? Yeah. I mean, it's Sully. It's, it's yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. But you know what actually is is cool? Uh, I was I was writing about uh, Aaron Donald a few weeks ago for Football Outsiders, mm-hmm. and uh, I stumbled across this video from uh, Wade Phillips talking about his defense, and he was just talking about how he assigns guys – you know, it, it, like from, from, from afar, it sounds like such a simple concept, but NFL coaches – I know we've talked about this. They're dumb. They're not. They're not all the, the brightest guys. Where, where Wade Phillips, he just says, "What can, what do you do best?" And that's all that I'm going to ask you to do. So if he's a guy who's a good run stopper, then he's going to put him in position to make run stopping plays. If he is a guy that's really athletic and maybe a better pass rusher, he's he uh, sticks him more in the gaps so they can just shoot gaps. And if he has a guy who's rare, and he said, you know, he's coached. Uh, uh, JJ Y, and I think it was uh, who's the guy who played for the Bills. Bruce Smith. Yeah. Yeah. He said he coached him for a little bit. And he said what he would do is just say, you can do whatever you want for the most part, because I know that you are good enough and athletic enough to just recover off any mistake that you make. So, yeah, J.J. Watt. OK, Sully, maybe he uh, <laughs> he, he lets the running back go for a seven yard gain. But if he gets a 20 sack season, I think you're OK with that. <laughs> Sorry, I just wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I'll, t- I'll take my defensive tackle uh or defensive end whatever you want to call him giving up a few run plays per game if he's going to give me a 20 sack season i'm, I'm okay with that trade-off <laughs> uh, all right let's let's talk about uh stefan diggs adam thielen um and i i guess laquan treadwell i don't know uh wh- what do you think about that 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 receiver pair in general like just because you know i know what vikings fans think of them they think that they're, they're elite that they both should go to the pro bowl uh, and I don't hate that characterization at all, but I kind of want to know what other people think. Uh, I mean, I, it's probably the best receiver to do in the league right now, right? Yeah, I, that, I I, that's what I'm trying to say. But like, I don't know, like Antonio Brown, Martavis Bryant, when Martavis Bryant like wants to play, uh, Julio Muhammad, obviously, um, cause Julio's the best number one, uh, him or Antonio. So, you know, how do you weigh that, that sort of thing? But yeah, I, I yeah. think. The Viking, like in terms of Diggs and Thielen, it feels like the, like two guys that are both really good, but it's not like one guy is just significantly better than the other. Where like you look at Julio and Sanu, it's like oh my god, like Julio is just way better than Sanu. But I think I, I think Thielen is better than Diggs, but it's not like in such a monstrous way where uh, you can forget about Diggs at all in the passing game. Like they they seem to be. In terms of talent level, pretty evenly matched, and I mean they both play at such a high level. It, it's it's makes them hard to stop because you can't key in on one guy because then the other guy will just hurt you. If you want to key in on Thielen, Diggs will hurt you. If you want to key in on Diggs, then Thielen will hurt you. And it, those are two guys that are both really hard to play in uh, in one on one situations. And it, it's it's so funny looking at I guess the tag that Adam Thielen has gotten. I mean we we do this where we racially stereotype guys all the time and dealing gets like this characterization that was a possession guy or just a guy who doesn't make explosive plays, but he's like, he's, he's one of the most explosive receivers in the league. I think, and you can even see in that screenplay he had against the Rams where he took that thing to the house, like 70 yards. And I mean, you, you people talk about, Oh, he's so gritty. He's so scrappy and he just works hard. Yeah. I mean, that's all probably true, but he did run a four four at his pro day. You know, he's he's no slouch athletically, and and the way that they play off of each other, Diggs and Thielen, it it really opened things up for that Viking offense. And uh, just to have two guys who could both be number ones on teams uh, around the same skill level is is really really cool. Yeah, I also I also kind of like um, the the workman like characterization that Thielen gets, which to some degree is like deserved, but also like. 
No one really says anything when Thielen's asking for a flag, but you know when Odell's asking for a flag, he's a diva. You know, that's yeah. <laughs> I mean, that could be a whole podcast on its own. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, Thielen asks for a lot of flags, guys. Um, but um, yeah, so my uh, so I'm going to ask you in a, in a little bit. Um, it'll be my next question, sort of. How do you think the Falcons kind of deal with that receiver pair? But um, I've become really attached to this this style comparison. Um, you know, I don't think Thielen's as good as this player, but I think stylistically, I don't think it's a bad comparison. So far, every time I've mentioned it, I haven't been laughed at. But um, I respect you, Charles. So I want to know what you want to say. I think stylistically, Thielen and Larry Fitzgerald are not too far apart. Hmm. I didn't even really thought about that. Really. Um. I don't. I don't hate that. I don't hate that. I I I feel like Larry was more physical. Yeah. At his peak. Yeah. But uh, you know, Thielen kind of reminds me of this is gonna be like a throwback reference that I don't know how many people are gonna get. Uh, but Jimmy Smith from the Jaguars, he kind of reminds me of him. Like, Ooh, I like a that. really a really good route runner. Uh, he's gonna catch almost every pass. Uh, less cocaine than <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy <Smith>. less. <laughs> Maybe not none though. Maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> I don't knows? know what Dylan's got this, going we, on. We don't know what his life, life is. Yeah, but uh, just the way that he gets open so easily, and he's always going to make these catches. It just it kind of reminds me of the way that Jimmy Smith used to play. Jimmy Smith should be in the Hall of Fame. All right. So next question, I one hundred percent believe that. Next question is: How do you think the Falcons deal with Thielen and Diggs? Uh, honestly, I, I think you you just got to hope that Desmond Trufant can play because. If if he can't, then one of those guys is going to have a huge game. Like who was ever not being guarded by Robert Offer is going to have a massive game. Uh, but I, I do think like if both if 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 you can get Trufant healthy, I, I think you just kind of play a lot of man coverage and see if your guys can stack up against their guys because that's kind of what they've been doing for the whole season. And for the up until Trufant got hurt against the uh, the Bucks game, they've been pretty successful with that. I mean, Trufant's been playing great football uh, all season long, I think, even though Falcons fans think he's a bust that should be traded sometimes for some ungodly reason. But uh, if you're Falcon play, I, Sorry, I feel... Wait, what? Oh, yeah, there are Falcons fans who think that uh, Desmond Trufant is terrible, so... <laughs> Holy crap, what? All right. Well, okay, I, I want to get this take from you real quick. Uh, a, would you take Trufant or Rhodes at this point? Because Trufant was clearly better than Rhodes first two and a half, maybe three seasons. Um, but now maybe it's an open question. Who knows? Um, so would you take Trevon or Diggs? A, B, generally speaking, we don't have to actually go through the cornerback rankings this year, especially because they're kind of weird this year. But generally speaking, you know, where would you rank Desmond Trufant among cornerbacks? Oh, I, you see, I, I think that Trufant and Rhodes, like they're like that same tier of player, you know, where yeah. maybe it's, it's not like prime Revis, but it's just like a step below that. Or like, or not prime Sherman, but a step below that. So I, I just since I see them pretty equally, I'm just going to go true font because that's my squad. But sure. uh, and then if I was going to rate true font, I, w- I I would have them in like that, like six to ten range. I guess I would say where you know he, he I don't think he's as good as you know, Jalen Ramsey or or what Marshawn Lattimore has done this year, which has been outstanding. But mm-hmm. I don't I don't think he's too far off from uh from those guys and that i'll kind of put Rhodes in that same tier where where would you put the other jimmy smith the one that plays for the ravens oh this season i think he's been outstanding um yeah he he that's like the one watchable thing about baltimore's defense or baltimore's team their secondary because i mean you you really have no reason to turn into a ravens game unless you're either a masochist a ravens fan or you like watching their uh their secondary play which is i I just kind of flip when the Ravens come on offense, honestly, I just flip back to ref, red zone and then go back when they're on defense because I like watching their defense play. But, uh, yeah, Jimmy Smith has been great. I think Casey Hayward has kind of been underrated. He's mm-hmm. been unbelievable this year. And you know, There's just been a lot of good cornerback play from uh, Ramsey uh, to Lattimore, Hayward, Trufant, Rhodes, even uh, that rookie out in Buffalo, Trey White. He's been playing really yeah, good Trey football this season. Trey White's been playing season. real well. Uh, yeah. A.J. Bouye, which is not a huge surprise. He had a good season last year, too, but... No one's really talking about him. He's playing well. Uh, the guy, the guy opposite Marshawn Lattimore, Ken Crawley, has been playing all right. It's a weird, it's yep. a weird season, but I like it. Yeah, I, I mean, besides the injury to my son, Deshaun Watson, it's been a really fun season. Yeah. Oh God. 
<laughs> Terrible. Um, all right, so let's talk quickly about about the other uh, pass catchers before we get to like a score prediction and and all that. Um, so you got Kyle Rudolph, uh, you got Jarek McKinnon, and Latavius Murray. Who who do you think matches up to those players? Who among those players worries you, and why? Uh, McKinnon scares me just because the Falcons have, even with their upgrades with uh, Deion Jones, Devondre Campbell, Keanu Neal, Brian Poole, they still suck at guarding backs out of the backfield. And that's something that I've just accepted they'll never be good at. So McKinnon definitely scares me more than Murray this week. Because, I mean, if, if you want to just run with Murray toe-to-toe with the Falcons' defense, like he'll probably have a, a decent game. But if you want to run your offense through Murray, that's that's more than fine with me because you know this, this is kind of getting off track but it's kind of cool like looking at the the way that uh statistic or statistically you can see that nfl point values are starting to change like the the browns they have statistically the best run defense in the league this year but still like on a points for play basis they're one of the worst defenses in the league mm-hmm. and then if you look at the jags defense they have you know they, they, they've been better over the past month or so but for the most part, they're still in like the bottom four of the league in terms of run defense, and they still have like by far the best like points for play, uh, adjusting the yards per attempt, value stuff like that. So it's just kind of cool seeing how the how how much more impactful passing is than running is right now. And like if you just want to run with Latavius Murray all day long, like, that's fine. I, I'm more afraid of McKinnon out of the backfield for sure. You think some of that is because McKinnon smoked y'all in 2015, or? Or you just in general, you're just like scat backs. I don't want anything to do with them. In in general, scat backs. I don't want any part. All it's because right. they always mess the Falcons up. All right, and then quickly, Case Keenum. What do you think? Kind of weird, right? Very weird. Uh, but hey, nothing. Almost nothing has made sense this season. Uh, I mean, just with like the, the Eagles going from eight and eight to whatever are they ten and one now, and look like like maybe Super Bowl favorites. Uh, to Deshaun Watson coming out in, I mean, he's still like sixth in the league in, in passing touchdowns, and he hasn't played in a month. Uh, nothing has made sense. So hey, why not Case Keenum uh, come out and be like a top ten quarterback for the season? Yeah, he, I mean, he, he's he's fun. I mean, his 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 style of play for me is is it's he's, very aesthetic. Like I like that Yolo. Like Yolo. He loves he loves yeah. taking chances. Yeah, it's fun, and you know he, he he's not really afraid of anything. He's he's playing with house money. Uh, and it, it's, it's really fun to watch, like, just that chaotic brand of football that I, I love to watch. Yeah, like Zimmer said it. He's got balls. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. So, um, A, you have a Pro Bowl ballot. You can vote for eight quarterbacks. You don't have to tell me who the other seven are, but do you think Case Keenum's on that ballot? Um, for healthy guys, he might be. Yeah, if, yeah it's got to be guys that you think will play 12 to f- 16 games this season yeah uh yeah sure why right. not yeah why not yeah uh and then uh and then b you think the vikings are doing the right thing by uh by a keeping it week to week in terms of who they're naming their starter and b not playing teddy uh i i kind of feel like zimmer wants to play teddy really badly but it's kind of hard to justify that with how Case Keenum has been playing so far, but I kind of feel like like that's one of the situations where Zimmer wants it so bad that as soon as as soon as Case Keenum has a bad game, he's going to put Teddy in there. But I, I, I'm I'm fine with him playing Keenum for now. I think we all want to see Teddy play, and we all want him to be successful and and come show out. But I mean, you don't really need to disrupt the the steady flow of things with how Keenum's playing. Sure. All right, so another Mike Zimmer revenge game, former defensive coordinator for the Falcons for I guess a year. Uh what do you think the uh what do you think the score uh, of this game's going to end up being? Uh I'm going to go uh, it's so tough. I, what's the spread on this game? Do you know? Uh no, I I think I, I put down the Vikings two and a half, but that was like 2 weeks ago. Things have probably changed. Yeah. I'll pick up right uh, now. Okay. I mean, without knowing the spread, I'm just gonna go Falcons uh, 27-24. Yeah, you hit the spread. Um, in fact, you actually, yeah, okay, you hit everything. The over under is forty seven and a half, and the spread is three minus three Atlanta. The Falcons are favored now. Yeah. Wow. Remember, I, I put in that bet two weeks ago. It, it makes sense that things have changed. Yeah, it does. 
Yeah, so 27-24, Falcons. Go Dirty Birds. All right. Uh, you know, I'll take the Vikings again. I don't care. Uh, let's say the Vikings uh, limit explosive plays. I guess the Vikings are number one in the league at preventing explosive plays. Uh, so if they can keep the Falcons to something average in terms of their explosive playmaking capability, they'll keep the Falcons to, uh, I don't know, 21, three touchdowns, no field goals, which sucks. I've got Matt Bryant on both of my teams, whatever, and the Vikings win – by putting up 30, because the, their offense is a thing now. So that's my guess. Uh, any uh, any final thoughts before I let you go? Uh, no, this has been fun, yeah, for I sure. Uh, yeah, we'll probably we'll probably do something again uh, if the Falcons make a deep playoff push or something. We'll see. All right, sounds good. And we're back. Good job, Arif. Thank you. I, uh, <laughs> give it give it maybe like one more season, and you will have completely eliminated the need for me to be on the show. Like I will, I'll be completely superfluous now that you uh, have like spread your wings and flown into the technical realm as well as the analytical. <laughs> I've uh, I've I've had the opportunity to host a podcast here and there. And I can tell you, I am not good at the hosting part. So uh, you'll always have a job. Yay. Well, uh, I can read mailbag questions. We've got uh, we've got a handful of actually pretty pretty interesting ones this week. So uh, Stephen A. Smith, not that Stephen A. Smith, he spells it with a V, writes in uh, any word on how Kyle Sloter is doing? I haven't come across any interviews or press, etc. Uh, yeah, I mean, we typically don't hear very much about the third quarterback when it comes to you know how they're doing, how they're progressing. We didn't hear a bunch about uh, Taylor Heineke. Um, we did hear kind of quite a bit about Joe Webb uh, when he was the third quarterback, but that was, I think it's kind of unusual. Uh, Webb was, in an unusual case, drafted to be a receiver, had a good enough arm in uh, in rookie minicamp that he impressed Brad Childress enough to be switched back to quarterback. and uh, a Dynamic in a way that, that I don't think uh, a quarterback has been for the Vikings since, like, 2004. So, you know, that was that a... Was, uh, that, that was a bit of a unique case, but generally we don't hear that much about third quarterbacks, and I have no understanding of, of how exactly Sluder is doing. I can say from a con, uh, contextual perspective, the Vikings had a lot of opportunity to uh, to add quarterbacks to the practice squad on the roster, and they really haven't been, which is kind of a passive indication that they at least like what they see out of Sluder. Um, they've also had uh, you know moments where they could have cut him from the roster and put him on the practice squad and or exposed him to waivers. Uh, and they've chosen not to do that, so they still seem as valuable. Um, so, yeah, even when they've added other players to the roster, they've kept them on. So that's the best indication we have, uh, and those indications are pretty positive. And uh, thank you to Steven for trying to create even more quarterback controversy in Minnesota. <laughs> because that's that's what we need right now, is is more quarterbacks. <laughs> hey, he's he's under contract for the next, this morning we can say for any other quarterback. Uh, that's your quarterback of the future, Kyle Sluter. <laughs> Uh, email Ramsvik writes in, what's up with Jaleel Johnson? Are the other defensive tackles playing too well for him to get playing time? Uh, that's that's almost precisely it. Like, I guess I don't know if Jaleel Johnson is playing poorly. He looked really good in training camp, looked really good in the preseason, especially when he was given the opportunity to play the three technique instead of the one technique position. Uh, and I think that he's learning some of the stuff that, that needs to um, that needs to happen for him to be versatile, for him to play both one and three technique. Really, he he knows more how to rush the passer than stop the run at this point, uh, and you know, kind of despite what you'd expect from from somebody like as as, as large as him, like three hundred twenty pounds, I think. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that's I, I'm, I'm sure that plays a role, but I think most of it is just yeah, the Vikings have you know a, a really good setup when a defensive tackle, and they don't really have to worry that much about it. Um, so that that probably plays a role, especially because um, they have a defensive ends who can play inside. Um, when, when, you know, they, they need to have like a, a pass rushing package. So I think that plays a bigger role than, than him, you know, not having learned enough or, or playing well enough. Um, but it will say, you know, there's, there's something to be gleaned from the fact that he's never on the active roster because it's not as if, you know, Zimmer isn't willing to, to put, you know, fourth round picks, uh, rookies into, uh, into action, right? I mean, Ben Gideon is is kind of the the other linebacker of the base package, and he plays fairly often. So uh, I'm, I'm sure there's some reason that it, aside from how talented the other defensive tackles are, but I do think uh, the other defensive tackles, being as talented as they are, play a big role. Caleb Arndt 
writes in, given the relative volatility of recently drafted quarterbacks, such as uh, Dak Prescott, Jameis Winston, Derek Carr, Marcus Mariota, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Jared Goff, mysteriously not on the list. Um, yeah, right. Do you think it's possible that Wentz has a high propensity to drop off next year, or has he shown enough this year to write off any aspersions about his play? Get used to the word aspersions. Uh, I would say it's not very likely that uh, he drops off significantly. I think it is very likely that he drops off, and not because I have a, like a particular bias against Carson Wentz. I think anybody who shows up big kind of out of nowhere, and I'm going to say it's out of nowhere because his rookie year relative to other rookie years, uh, once you sort of era adjust things, was not that impressive. Um, and I think the same is true of Jared Goff, too, so it's not like I'm, I'm isolating Wentz. I think they'll drop off just because of regression to the mean. I think that there's um, just a... I think it is unlikely that in his second year, his true ability is as, you know, a top five quarterback in the NFL. So I think he'll drop off. Maybe he'll play at a top 10 level for a while, but I don't think he'll drop off to the point where people are like, wow, I can't believe we got tricked by, by how much that, that second year was so good. Uh, Cause there were indications that Blake Bortles in his second year uh, was not as good as, as you know, the 35 touchdowns may have advertised. Um, and I said this, you know, a couple of times or an article I referenced that Teddy was actually doing better than Blake, despite sort of the touchdown numbers. And uh, and that kind of bore out because you know, he that year he also led the league in turnovers and, and Wentz is not really doing that. Something that I'm actually kind of surprised by because, you know, I thought he would be a particularly turnover prone quarterback. Um, so, yeah, I expect next year his turnovers will probably increase, but not because he's more prone to them than the average quarterback, but because he's playing at such a high level right now that it is more likely that this is an outlier season, kind of like it is for Case, kind of like it was for, you know, Nick Foles and Josh McCown in 2013, um, you know, kind of like it was for Josh Freeman in 2010. Um, yeah, I think it's likely that that he falls off because of regression, but I don't think that, you know, he's shown traits that are going to be exploitable kind of uh, going into the next year. So, yeah, I mean, I think that he's a little bit over, oh, a lot overrated, um, but I think it's not because, you know, he's secretly playing catastrophically bad. Uh, it's just because it's pretty unlikely that he's the best quarterback in the league or anything like that. Like an MVP award would maybe indicate, which by the way, Tom Brady's playing better at quarterback. I have no idea why you wouldn't give Tom Brady the MVP, except I've discussed this before. And it's because Tom Brady's competing against himself. Carson Wentz is competing against other people. Uh, Don from Ohio with a question in a similar vein. Do you think the Eagles might be a little overrated since they've only beaten one team with a winning record so far? I mean, maybe like, so the thing with that is, uh, if you're, if you're taking care of bad teams in a convincing fashion, that gives us a lot of information about how good you are. Um, and this happens a lot in college football and it tends to bear out, uh, Florida state, for example, uh, the year they, uh, the year after they won the national championship, um, they played a bunch of good teams um, but played very, very poorly in those games. But they did happen to win um, in, in a very ugly fashion. And they didn't do very well against bad teams, but they won those two. And people were like, you know, wins matter, and that's kind of it. And and it was pretty easy to see that they kind of, you know, were going to drop off. We've seen other teams uh, in college football that have played a pretty easy schedule except one or two games, um, but have won them in a, in a very convincing fashion. And then they tend to do well. Uh, in in sort of their first, you know, quote unquote, real test. That happens a lot too. Uh, and so I think it's kind of the situation you have uh, with the Eagles where um, the fact that they're not just winning ugly against these bad teams is a pretty good indication. Now that's not 100%, that's not a, a, enough information to tell us exactly how good they are because um, a good example is the Rams where the Rams really were taking care of some really bad teams in a pretty convincing way. Uh, but... Uh, you know, when when they were up against good teams, and in particularly when they were up against good defenses, they they really struggled. Um, so Jacksonville, Seattle, when everyone was healthy, Minnesota, um, those are all good indications that no matter how well they played against those really good teams, that um, there's like some level of 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 quality um, that they struggled against. So that could be true for the Eagles, given that they they haven't had. Uh, the most difficult schedule in the world. I think by Football Outsiders DVOA, they've had the 27th most difficult schedule. And, and like the Vikings, I think, have had the second or third. I think that's artificially inflated by um, by the fact that like the Saints uh, were not who they are now. Um, 
and uh, the Steelers are a very volatile team that show up as a as a good team on the schedule, um, but sometimes have really amazingly good days like they did against the Vikings, and sometimes have like these weirdly bad days like against the Packers. So, yeah, I mean, the Vikings have had a much more difficult schedule, um, but the Eagles have done better against bad opponents than the Vikings have. So maybe the Eagles aren't the number one team. Maybe people are overrating them, but not by much. I mean, they're a top five team. But what about the Giants game? They like barely uh, won. Y- yeah, <laughs> but I mean, I mean that like that happens though. Like, uh, if uh, if you consistently beat bad teams by a good amount, you give yourself some credibility. The one or two times you don't do well against a bad team, that's like fair. it's like the totality of what they've done is a good resume. Uh, Don from Ohio goes on. I play a reef in fantasy football this week. Does he agree to the loser must shave their beard stipulation? I don't even have evidence that Don from Ohio has a beard. Why would I agree to that? <laughs> Best possible answer. Um, I don't know if you actually, uh, another, I think cause people love hearing about other people's fantasy football leagues. Um, enjoyable aside in the Norse code hangouts channel was, uh, when did you, did you and James talk about how you, uh, you called them out saying that, uh, the, the Steelers kicker would not have anything to do with him losing again this week. Yeah, no, yeah. Uh, well, that turned we out to be... I don't think we actually talked about that, but yeah, that's... Uh, in the chat, you know, he was like, uh, you know, the Steelers kicker's gonna screw me. And it's like, dude, I'm way ahead. It doesn't matter. And then the Steelers kicker screwed him. Yep, Steelers kicker missed the first extra point of the game, ensuring James's ignominious defeat once again. It's impressive. James is not trying to go all defeated. He just happens to be going <laughs> all defeated. And he's like happening. trying to convince us, you know, like, I'm my other league. I'm like, I'm amazing. I'm doing really well. I've only lost one game. It's like, James. I know. He'll post these like no weird photoshops of like mobile screenshots where he's like actually winning a fantasy football game. And we're like, James, why do you do this? <laughs> yeah, it's way too much work. <laughs> you don't have to like show us the postage names from your Canadian girlfriend, okay? <laughs> Exactly. Um, Kyle Slaby writes in, It seems our defense lacks the turnover numbers of other elite defenses this year. It's obviously not impacting the record, and turnovers are traditionally unpredictable, so is it unreasonable for me to fall for the gambler's fallacy and say that we're due for an early 2016-type streak of turnovers and subsequent scores? Uh, It's unreasonable to project that 2016 streak as happening, because the 2016 streak in particular, was marked as unsustainable um, by a couple of people, me included. Uh, and it's not, it, it, defensive scores are just like not a thing that that continues, which is one reason why the Jacksonville defense, which is currently the top uh, defense in the NFL, um, by DVOA and, and by, I think, by scoring and, and by a bunch of metrics, as well as a, bu- a bunch of people's eye tests and stuff, um, by a bunch of measures, they're the top defense in the NFL. I think that they will drop off. Um, not substantially they're still going to be a good defense they still may be the best defense um but how by how much they are the best defense is exaggerated i think by the fact that they've had a number of defensive scores so jacksonville as a team uh is, is probably going to drop off because they can't rely on that offense to score uh the same thing was true of the of the five and vikings that were relying on their defense to score in multiple games i think it's unreasonable to fall into that gambler's fallacy of saying that they're due for turnovers and scores but i do think the number of turnovers will increase not because they're due, but because, again, regression would indicate that the turnover rate that they're um, that they're at right now is lower than the quality of the individual defensive personnel and the overall defensive scheme that the Vikings have. Uh, and so the average turnover rate is is probably higher. Uh, the average like expected turnover rate is probably higher for the Vikings than it currently is. And so they'll regress upwards to that mean. So I think that it's reasonable to expect there to be more turnovers uh, as the season goes on and maybe as you enter the postseason. It is not reasonable to expect, like, multiple defensive scores. Why not? It'd certainly be nice. Fair point. Yeah. <laughs> and finally, Adam West writes in, Why would Chick-fil-A put a location in the Falcon Stadium if they're closed on Sundays? For uh, the the college playoff and other associated games in college i don't know that they make it all back on monday night uh occasionally that's like that's like one game (laughs) i know it's it's weird to me but people are still excited about it so 
Go ahead, I guess. That's so weird. Is it just so people like don't forget that Chick-fil-A is a thing? Like they're at the game and they're like, oh, I should get some Chick-fil-A tomorrow. Like <laughs> The concession stands exist as an advertisement. I feel like there's cheaper <laughs> ways to advertise Chick-fil-A than, uh, than buying and like, like preventing other commerce from happening. <laughs> it seems unfair. Yeah, that's, it's, it's crafty. It's, it's the kind of evil we've come to expect from Chick-fil-A. So Chick-fil-A is going to buy a bunch of like McDonald's and Wendy's locations and then just be like, ah, we're closed on Wednesdays now. <laughs> yeah, a bunch of people have mass on Wednesdays. We're closed on Wednesdays now for religious reasons. Exactly. Just, just box them out of the market. Um, is Chick-fil-A even good or is this like Chipotle where people say it's so amazing, but really it's just a fast food burrito, only this time a chicken sandwich? <laughs> well, I will contest the characterization of Chipotle. I'm not, it's not amazing. Chipotle is not amazing. But I would say it's, it raised the standard of what an average burrito should be. And it deserves credit for that. I think that they, they make a quality burrito. Um, is it overhyped? Probably. Chick-fil-A is pretty good um, for, for chicken, right? Like a chicken sandwich. For the, the chicken nuggets, I think, are actually pretty addictive. Um, it, I, it's, it's no five guys in terms of like fast food rankings or anything like that. Um, I think In-N-Out's better, even though In-N-Out's probably overrated. Um, but I mean, Chick-fil-A is pretty good and I can see why people are kind of obsessed, especially if, if people like their chicken sandwiches as much as I like their chicken nuggets, uh, I, I get it. Well, so to me, like uh, you excluding KFC from this list, cause they're kind of their own thing. They don't um, count. I think the Chipotle Chick-fil-A comparison is extremely apt because, uh, really? like you, I think that, uh, Chipotle kind of raised the bar for a oh, okay. like national chain that serves mission style burritos, but they're definitely second best behind Chipotle or Qdoba. Like Qdoba's number one. I mean, just better. People hate that take. People get really upset with the Qdoba's better than Chipotle take. That's crazy because they're wrong. Like, the, <laughs> well, for the, the explain your what separates Qdoba from Chipotle. I'm not disagreeing with you. I just I want you to kind of layer out this argument uh their queso is significantly better than chipotle's chipotle didn't even have queso until a couple months ago and now they have like this this weird cheese water situation I've going on not had chipotle's queso i'll take your word for it um it's it's not very good and it costs extra and so does guac and those two things are included in the price of your qdoba burrito should you desire them i think Chip- i think chipotle's guac tastes better than queso uh, than qdoba's guac uh that's true but not two dollars better yeah okay fair dollar uh, 80 by the way Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you're the, you're clearly the, uh, the the guac buyer in, uh, in this yeah, scenario. I, I haven't been to Chipotle in like four months, but I do know that. All right. Uh, the, is is the queso really not that? I can't believe the queso is extra. What is that? That's that's how Chipotle gets you. They nickel and dime you. You're like you get your chicken burrito and it's like six fifty or whatever. But then you know if you add either guac or queso, then all of a sudden you're up to eight bucks. And all the burritos at uh, Qdoba are the same price. You can just get whatever you want. You can get two different meats. You can get guac and queso. You can get neither. Um, for a while, they had two different kinds of queso. They had a, a spicy Diablo queso that was amazing. Um, I think their salsas are better quality. I think their uh, their red salsa, and particularly their habanero salsa, is uh, more delicious than the Verde or the Roja at uh, Chipotle. Um, yeah, I'll agree with that, but I will add this. I think that so I always get a steak burrito when I go to either of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, the quality of the steak at Chipotle is consistent. The quality of the steaks that I've had across various Qdoba locations is inconsistent. I've had better steak burritos at Qdoba, but the steak quality I've had at some Qdobas is worse than the steak quality I've had at Chipotle. Yeah, and I have like uh, consistency complaints about both places, but I think that's just endemic to fast food. I think... Uh Sometimes they, the, depending on how busy the place is, they're not too like strict with their hold times. Like they don't throw their rice out fast enough. And then you end up with like rice that turns back into dry rice. Okay. Which yeah. is terrible. And, uh, that i and you get, you know, dry steak. And I think that happens less often at Chipotle because Chipotle's just tend to be busier. I don't know why that is. And, uh, so people are just like eating the food instead of staff having to worry about like, you know, throwing it out or turning it over. Okay. Um, well, so that, that's a pretty decent argument that Chipotle offers a better quality burrito than Qdoba. However, I have noticed, and this I think is, uh, I, I think if uh, Qdoba, like higher ups knew about this, they would do something about it. So I'm loath to say anything, but I feel like 
even if you get uh, an identical burrito, like if you get the identical order at Chipotle versus Qdoba, you'll get more stuff in your burrito at Qdoba. Not fair. But uh, anyway, so Qdoba is better than Chipotle, and I feel like Popeyes is better than Chick Fil A. Chick Fil A is good; it's a strong number two. But uh, if I'm doing a fast food chicken sandwich, uh, I will I will pull over for Popeyes, and uh, maybe not so much for Chick Fil A. Yeah, I strongly agree that Popeyes is better. I will say. Not a deal breaker because it's fast food, but the fact that it's noticeable is weird. The service at Chick-fil-A is way better than at Popeye's. Ooh, that's uh, true. Yeah. Why is it, that? I, I don't know. It's, that's weird. It's top down sort of thing. It's an organizational thing. Uh, is that going to change my decision? Probably not very often, but it's something to think about. Yeah. I mean, for, for me, the the whole like interacting with people that work in fast food is just like it's like ripping off a band-aid it's just like something that i have to do and i do as quickly as i can until it's over the worst service i've ever received was at a kfc which huge surprise oh no i, I totally worst believe fast that food chain. that yeah. uh that 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 matches my my experiences pretty neatly but uh, you know, kfc is such like it's sort of like half fast food because like how long i mean i know they're just like frying it and like warming up the sides but how long should a 15-piece bucket take? Like, how long should the one guy running the counter have to disappear and back for? Like, I, I don't have... It messes with my frame of reference. Fried chicken takes a long... I mean, you fried chicken. It takes kind of a long time to actually fry chicken. Yeah, it's not like, like doing... That's what I'm saying. It's not like doing, like, a chicken patty or, like, chicken nuggets or whatever. It's its, its own thing. And so I don't, like... I, I'll, I'll be standing there for, like, five minutes while the two people on staff are, like, both in the back cooking. And I'm like, have I been here for too long? I don't. I don't know. <laughs> that that might be related to, i mean like i think kfc is a turnover problem because i mean they're the amount of people going to kfc has dramatically decreased over the past like 10 years i'm sure everyone's seen uh that youtube video that i don't really want to talk about or link to because uh i mean the guy stole a bunch of stuff but anyway uh the number of people going to chipotle has decreased and that decreases the turnover which means they either have to like weirdly cook to order which is bad for fried chicken or the stuff's just going to sit there forever and dry out. Ugh. Yeah. Oh, uh, the best reason why Qdoba is better than Chipotle, no E. coli outbreak. Yeah, that's true. It's a pretty strong argument. So, well... F- Although some people think... So some people are so committed to Chipotle that they think the E. coli outbreaks are good because it deters people from the store and therefore shorter wait times. Uh, that is crazy talk. Shorter wait times. I <laughs> just go to Qdoba. When was when was the last time you saw a lot of twenty pe- a line of twenty people at a Qdoba? When was the last time they gave free burritos at Halloween? Ooh, that's true. Mm. God, now I kind of want a burrito. <laughs> I wonder if I wonder if the Qdoba nearby is open. Well, uh, where else are you going to get a burrito in like Boulder, Colorado? It's going to be so difficult for you. Uh, well, it's Denver, not Boulder. And uh, there's just, there oh, just even happens more to be a Qdoba yeah. like two blocks from my house. Whereas if I wanted to like venture either further out of the city or like closer to downtown, I could find a burrito truck that would offer me a superior burrito experience. Although probably not at eleven o'clock on uh, Wednesday. So I'm sure there's a burrito place open to Uber Eats. No, I don't. <laughs> Uh, there's actually only one burrito place that delivers on Uber Eats near my house, and it is the worst Mexican food I've ever had. It is literally the like the only reason to eat it is because it's the only place that still delivers at four in the morning. Hey man, if you don't have quality, you better have availability. Yeah, exactly, and that's I mean they have they have captured a significant amount of my income simply by being open when I was hungry <laughs> and no one else was. Well, all right, so that's uh, going to do it for the mailbag, and consequently, episode 211 of Norse Code. Um, you're still hacking away at the uh, the Trey Waynes piece. I imagine the um, like shift in his performance may have made your arguments a little more complicated. Yeah, I mean, he didn't play all that well last week. Um, it's not. I don't know if it really changes kind of the tone of my article. I'll probably have to acknowledge it, but it does like raise some questions as to like how sustainable it is, and I have to. You know, think about, you know, what elements of play have improved that are uh, repeatable and what elements of play are like not that repeatable. So I don't think that's really added much lead time. I'm still just hacking away at it. 
Um, but it is kind of like an, another interesting note. Well, uh, keep your eyes peeled for that. It'll arrive one of these days. Also, uh, check out Setting the Edge. Great show, even though Justice is on it. Um, <laughs> no, I, I'm kidding. I, I love Justice. I, I always enjoy it when he's on the show, assuming the show is actually able to happen. Um, right. But yeah, check out Chuck on Twitter, at 4Verts. Uh, check out his work on uh, Football Outsiders and um, Go Vikings. James will return early next week with a recap of the Falcons game and then uh, onward and upward. We will uh, take a victory lap when we are 10-2 and two and uh, Julio Jones gets completely bottled up. That's, that's my prediction. All right. So uh, until then, demand excellence. Demand Norse Code. Norse Code is the largest and only division of Norse Code LLC. You can find Norse Code on the Daily Norseman, SB Nation's Vikings blog at dailynorseman.com. You can also find it on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play Music Podcasts, or wherever else fine podcasts are aggregated. Our Vikings blogger extraordinaire and generally useful human is Arif Hassan, who can be found on Twitter at Arif Hassan NFL. Our intrepid producer and occasional co-host James Bogachnik can be found on Twitter at Big Mono or curating the official Norse Code Twitter feed at Norse Code DN. I'm your host with a firm grasp of the obvious, Dusty O'Connell, and my name is my handle on Twitter. If you'd like to donate a few bucks to the show, your one-time donation can be made at paypal.me slash Norse Code, or a recurring monthly contribution can be made by visiting patreon.com slash Norse Code. Please visit our website, norsecodepodcast.com, where you'll find links to our Facebook and YouTube pages, along with the episode archive and some other good stuff. And any questions or comments that won't fit in a tweet can be emailed to norsecodepodcast at gmail.com. And on behalf of the entire Norse Code staff, thank you so much for listening. Our formula is this. We go out, we hit people in the mouth. 